This thing is a Vector MZ. I picked it up at the Vintage Computer Fair over in the Computer History Museum. And it's basically uh, an S100 bus system. So this is the back plane over here. Um, it came with two disk drives. Um, and there's a power supply over here. And that's really all there is to it. Um, so this was um, created by the Vector Graphic uh, Company. Um, you may be familiar with them from their insanely overpriced vector boards. Um, I think this uh, thing used to cost a thousand or maybe a couple thousand. Um, again, insanely expensive. But um, basically that's all this is. It's an S100 bus backplane. So um, here is the disk drive card, vector graphic. That probably means it cost about $1,000 on its own. Um, I will not be powering those up. In fact, I'm not even certain this is going to be compatible with my S100 bus system. Um, I do know that there is a voltage regulator over here, which is a looks like a 7912, so that's a negative 12 volt regulator. So anyway, I basically wanted to rip out this power supply and put in an ATX power supply. And uh, I just wanna see how easy that is to hook up to the backplane. Now the interesting thing about this backplane is, whoops, if I tilt it, you can see on the bottom and maybe even along the top, yeah, you can see resistors. Um, so this is basically an actively terminated backplane. Uh, the problem with S100 bus backplanes is that um, there aren't grounds between the signals, so the signals do get kind of noisy. Uh, and apparently the active termination, which consists of a resistor going to plus and a resistor going to minus, um, helps in that regard. So anyway, I am going to take a screwdriver and start removing these capacitors. They're definitely fully discharged. That's always a good thing. So let's just go ahead and remove these capacitors out, or at least unwire them. And in terms of the uh, wires, We've got these green wires, which are obviously ground. These green wires, which are also obviously ground. And then we've got these red wires and these red wires, which all go to here. Now to me, red means plus five. Uh, let's see, we've got some purple wires and we've got some yellow wires. So if I had to make a guess, I would say that uh, the red wires are the plus five or actually plus eight. Uh, the purple wires would be the plus 12 or actually plus 16. And the yellow wires would be the minus 16. And I could be totally wrong. Oh yeah, and this must be a negative voltage because ground is connected to the positive. So at least I got that one right. Okay, so now we've got all of the wires removed from the capacitors. So these are these boards here, which I'm just going to tuck over there. This I'm just going to tuck over to the side. Okay, so now the capacitors are affixed to the bottom using some kind of nut and it looks like there aren't any screws on the other side. So I'm going to need a nut driver to remove those. I'll just get rid of all these nuts. That's a pretty big capacitor. It is a 28,000 microfarad, 25 volt DC. Power cap, Garden Grove, California. National capacitor, made in USA. 
54B80-8031. So could that be 1980, week 31? And I'm dropping washers into the slots. That's not great. The only problem with this is that the nuts tend to get stuck. Why don't I do this the right way? Okay. So this one is the same type of capacitor, the same value, 8031. All right, capacitor. Okay, and ah, this one is different. It is 60,000 microfarads, 15 volts DC. So that tells me that this can't be the 18 volt uh, bus supply. Uh, it's got to be less than 15 volts. So this must be the 8 volt bus supply. So I was correct. Uh, these other ones are 25 volts, which indicate that the plus and minus uh, 16 volt supplies would be regulated by those capacitors. So down here, it's hard to see, but these square things over here are diode bridges. So those are the rectifier diode bridges to rectify the AC voltage that's coming out of the, uh, the uh, transformer. Uh, there should be, I thought there would be three of them, but I only see two. Um, there would be one for each voltage, so maybe there's one hiding somewhere. So those need to be removed as well. So I'm just gonna unscrew this. Oh, I found what appears to be, that's interesting. This is um, something that goes on the edge of these cards, um, kind of like this. And then this, let's see, I think it goes like this. So it, so it lays flat against the card like this, but then when you wanna remove the card, you open this up and press down and that sort of forces this card up. It looks like the rectifier uh, goes to a bunch of wires that are also zip tied. So I'm gonna to have to remove the zip ties. Okay, so this is the rectifier. Uh, does it say anything on the side? It does. It says GI, looks like general instruments. That's interesting. KBPC 25-02. And then over here it says 8038. I guess that is a date code also. So I would date this to um, the second half of 1980. All right, that's the rectifier. It seems to have a, probably a MOV, an MOV, a metal oxide varistor. So that would be for protection. It's, uh, it's on the AC side, which makes sense. So that's one. And it's pretty much the same thing. So that's this side of the transformer. So now we deal with the other side of the transformer. It looks like I can probably take the transformer out and then pull these wires off, I think. So I'm just gonna remove those zip ties. Can always replace them. So I looked it up online and apparently the MZ, um, the Vector MZ did actually come with um, some, with a CPU card and a monitor and possibly a printer. And the whole thing cost $4,800 uh, back in 1980. Like I said, everything having to do with vector graphic was uh, hideously expensive. And I would always look in catalogs at vector graphic uh, prototyping cards, and they were always, always just insanely expensive, and I definitely could not afford those. 
All right, um, I think what I'm gonna do is remove the fan. That way I might be able to get to um, some of the transformer connections. Besides, we're not gonna need the fan. Um, and the reason that we're not gonna need the fan is A, we're not gonna have a crazy huge power supply, and B, we're not gonna use linear regulators to regulate the voltages. Uh, we're gonna use an AT power supply, an ATX power supply, which is a switching power supply and it's very efficient. Uh, and it's got its own fan anyway. So let's go ahead and remove this. So here we've got a nut followed by a lock washer followed by a regular washer. So I don't know, I mean, I've, I've heard these split washers um, or split spring washers or whatever. I've heard that they basically, they don't do anything because once they're compressed, they don't actually supply any force. So I don't know. There was, uh, there was one vibration test on YouTube that they showed where these split washers didn't actually do anything under vibration. And I think NASA even published a, a paper basically showing that, that they were completely useless and that nobody should use them really. Now, some of you may be yelling at me because I'm taking apart this vintage thing that was really expensive and it's quite rare because there were only 5,000 made. Um, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Hey, I'm saving all the parts. I'm not like cutting it. I'm not cutting it apart. <laughs> At least not yet, if I can get this fan out. Now, I guess I could understand if, um, if this were some, you know, if this were like a board like this, uh, that was, I guess, fully functional. And uh, I would be like ripping it apart for the chips. I don't, I think I would do that. Um, I might do that with a no-name card, but you know, I, I'm not going to rip this apart. Um, likewise, again, I'm not ripping anything apart. I'm just disconnecting things and replacing things. I can always put it back afterwards. <sighs> Okay, I'm gonna to need to use something a little beefier. Okay. Okay. Hopefully that should give me enough room to do something. Nope. Back a little bit. There. So, we lift the transformer out, up and out. Okay, there we go. So, let me just pull this. So there's the huge, enormous transformer. Okay, something fell off. That was pretty huge. I'll probably just end up putting all this hardware in a baggie to keep it a little magnet. Perfect. This screwdriver is a bit too thick. Okay, so there's the fan connected to the enormous crimped terminals. There's another zip tie here that I don't need. Okay, so where does this go? This goes all the way to the back where there is a key. And a reset switch. So there is one wire that goes to the reset switch. The other wire goes to this jumper here. 
Presumably that is maybe the reset line. And the third one connected to the reset switch is connected to a ground for which I will need a Phillips head screwdriver. Okay. I'm just going to put this screw back. So the next question is, how do I get this reset switch out? Uh, do I even want to? Probably not. The reason why I might want to get it out is that there's also this key. Well, I think I'll leave the key in as well. So the key goes to a fuse in the back, which I don't need, and then to an IEC inlet, which is the technical term for where you plug the power cord into. Uh, so I don't really need any of that stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the zip tie. Remove the other zip tie. Okay, so the key, one end of the key goes to one end of the fuse. I'm just going to cut that wire because again, I can always resolder it pretty easily. And the other end goes to this thing, this complex. Uh, so Let's see if I can just unhook. Great. All right, so the fan is now out. This fan is a Rotron. Rotron airflow. So it looks like it was mounted this way so the air would flow in. All right. So what have we got left? Uh, this was the auxiliary. Don't need that anymore. I'm now going to pull all the hardware out. This is a non-magnetized screw. These are both non-magnetized screws. Okay, done. Okay, so that has totally disconnected the entire power supply. Now, the next thing we need to do is look at the power supply for this. So rather, not the power supply, but where they get connected to. So if I move these cords out of the way, these cables, oops, there's a screw. So we see two wires going down underneath here. One of them is yellow and one of them is purple. Uh, sorry, that's three wires. Yellow, purple, and red. Obviously plus eight and plus and minus 16. And the ground was connected here. So clearly what we should do is unzip tie this bundle right here and then find out where it comes out over here. And then we can hook that up to the power supply. So let's unzip some of these. be careful that I don't cut any of the cables. All right, so here's this. I'll unzip tie this since it appears we've got a few extra wires coming on it onto this harness, wire harness. Okay, so there's that. 
And there we go. We've got our three wires that we need for the power supply. So I will probably uh, check this to make sure, but I'm pretty certain that um, the plus eight is going to be connected to the red wire. Why don't we just look at that? Again, I'm not sure which side is which. Uh, I mean, I know that this is the ground side and this is the plus eight side. Uh, oh, look at this. There's actually uh, convenient uh, test points. Ah, okay. These screws are where these wires must be connected to, uh, and they're very nicely labeled. So this is going to be the plus eight, and the yellow is going to be the minus 16, and the purple, for completeness, is going to be the plus 16. Done. Okay, so we can connect that up to our power supply, and we will have power. Now, one interesting thing is that there appears to be a regulator in the corner over here. I'm going to have to remove that. Um, the regulator is there. Let's see what it says. The regulator is a 7805. So this is a five volt regulator. So we don't need that. Um, in fact, what we could do is we can just connect the two outer legs of the regulator uh, because, number one, we don't need the regulator, and number two, I don't think the regulator will, will use up any current. So maybe I'll just leave it there and, well, no, no. I think I'm going to desolder that. The reason that I'm going to desolder it is that if I connect a wire between input and output of this regulator and then later on I get rid of this thing or you know want to restore it I might actually forget that that, um, that that wire is there. It's a very easy thing to miss so I'm definitely going to have to desolder it. Now in order to desolder it I'm going to need to remove the back plane. Uh, what's this thing? Oh, this thing, that's neat. So that's to um, stabilize these sides. Um, so I'm going to need to remove the back plane and then flip it over and desolder. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so there we go. That's what the back plane looks like on the, on the other side. So we've got the connections here, of course. This is nicely labeled ground. This is labeled plus eight. Um, let's see. So oh, the uh, green appears to be flaking off here. That's interesting. over here and most of the green has flaked off on here. Interestingly, there is no sign of those green flakes in the box itself. Interesting. Yeah, so we've got resistors on here. So those resistors are the ones that go to plus five. On this end, we've got the resistors that go to ground. So that basically means that if nothing is connected to this, then those pins should be floating at two and a half volts. And that's basically what an active termination is. Looks like my dryer is done. Okay. Um, and then we've got these three resistors over here. Now let's see where they go. Interesting. So one of them goes from plus eight to ground and the other ones are for the plus and minus 16 volts. I guess they are to provide a load. This resistor 
is a 100 ohm resistor. And these resistors look like uh, 820 ohms, it looks like. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and desolder those components and then put this back. Okay, so I've desoldered those components. And um, I also had a closer look at these resistors. And in fact, for the ground side, that's this side, the resistors are 470 ohms. And on the plus five side, the resistors are 330 ohms. So 330 in parallel with 470 is about uh, 194 ohms. Uh, so each one of these resistor dividers would be drawing about 25 milliamps of current and at five volts. And I counted up these resistors, these resistor dividers, and there are 42 of them. So we're talking about 1.08 amps uh, just for the active termination. So that's okay. The ATX power supply can supply way more than that. So this board is actually ready to go. So now I just need to figure out how to mount the ATX power supply inside this. So I have, there's the switch, the inlet, the fan, and the power supply, cables. This doesn't really fit anywhere. And there's actually no power switch on this thing, unless the, the key is the power switch. Yeah, it says power on it. Okay. Well, I suppose what I could do is take this apart. Because what I really want to do is I've already got a power inlet. So that would be this. The key would be this button. Uh, this is just a voltage selector. There's probably a fuse inside here, so I wouldn't need the fuse. And the fan, I could probably, uh, I could probably 3D print a mount for it. So that way I could basically bring this and this out and then just mount the fan, mount this thing like right over here. Print in the thing. Three hours, Oh man. Okay, so I have the power supply now mounted. The fan grill is mounted on top of there. All right, we can see that I've started to wire up all the power supply wires. Um, this is the actual power supply connector. Um, I've cut off the plus five volts, uh, the plus 12 volts, the minus 12 volts, and a bunch of the grounds. And I've cut off this green wire from the power supply connector. This green wire needs to be connected to ground in order to send power out to the cable, uh, in order for the power supply to send power out to the cable. Um, so this is basically your, uh, on your PC, this would go to your power button, um, but there is actually non-switched uh, five volts. I I think it's this white wire or possibly this purple wire or maybe even this gray wire, one of those. Um, anyway, uh, so obviously that's just uh, standby power that's called VSB uh, or standby. Um, these red wires are all plus five volts. Um, so I have the plus five volts from the power supply wired into the plus five wire or plus eight wire that goes to the back plane. Um, this blue wire, uh, I believe, is negative 12 volts, um, and that goes to 
this yellow wire. And the yellow wire from the power supply is actually plus 12 volts, and that's going to go to the purple plus 16 volts wire that goes to the back plane. So now I've supplied the back plane with plus 5, minus 12, and plus 12. All right, so what I've done is I've set up my voltmeter over here, and I have connected it to... So actually, these are just screws, and I'm just touching that screw uh, with the probes. And this screw over here, all of these screws on the outside are connected to ground, so it's just going to hang out somewhere over there, just like that. Uh, so hopefully that's touching enough that I can get some sort of a reading. Now, I'm not sure, um, I'm pretty sure, so, that, so the, um, the key is now like this, and I think if I turn it like this, it will turn things on. So now I just need to find a cable to put uh, on the front. Okay, so I have a power cord, and I'm going to connect it and see what happens. Great. Okay, nothing should happen. Now I'm going to turn the switch, and excellent. The fan turns on, and we have 5 volts on the 8 volt rail, which is correct. Let's take a look at the other rails. This is the minus 16 volt rail, which is giving negative 11 volts, and the plus 16 volt rail is giving approximately 12 volts. So, this power supply seems to be a little weak in the, uh, in the negative 12 region, so. Well, since that power supply was really bad, um, I decided to buy another power supply. This one was just $18. Um, it's a triple power supply. It takes AC in, and it gives out plus 5 volts, plus 12 volts, and minus 12 volts. Uh, plus 5 volts at, I think, around 6 amps, um, plus 12 volts at 2.8 amps, and minus 12 volts at around 0.5 amps. Uh, and I hooked this up to my electronic load, and the 5 volts was pretty much rock solid uh, all the way up to its maximum. Uh, the 12 volt line sagged probably about 4%, and the minus 12 volts uh, sagged about minus, uh, sagged about 6%. So, you know, we're talking about 4 to 500 millivolts on a 12 volt line, which is actually pretty good. Um, so I decided to just hook this up, and as you can see, it's very small, and it also does not have a fan. So I hooked up the original fan over here. Uh, not only that, but it has no switch, it has no fuse, so I hooked up the original fuse, which is underneath the fan, and the switch, which is on the front, uh, this key. So, uh, let's just uh, fire it up and see if it works. All right, so here I have hooked up the power in the back, um, and the ground is just attached to the rails, uh, this, this metal railing, and that should theoretically be connected to ground, uh, which I can check by simply checking continuity. So, let's go to Vault and turn this on. Okay, and now maybe you can hear this humming. That's the fan and there's actually a light on the power supply. So let's check the 5 volt rail. There we go. We're getting 5.068 right on the money. And the negative rail is negative 12, and the positive rail is 12. So indeed, uh, this power supply is working just fine. And again, I tested it with an electronic load, so uh, we should not get any voltage drops or not any significant voltage drops when current is drawn from the power supply. So, uh, that is just about it for this S100 system. Uh, the next step, of course, would be to get some cards and start plugging them in, which will be the subject of future videos, uh, making cards to put in the S100 system. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.
on the next episode of Building a Retro Computer. That generates a lot of heat. I made a mistake over here. You're just going to be sitting there feeding solder in forever. The terminals sort of go up the side. I don't want to go any lower because then it becomes difficult for me to solder. And the reason for that is that other boards in the system can pull that line low. Why am I using a ground plane uh, once my soldering iron heats up a little more?